Let us, let us pray. Now, Lord, what wait I for? Our hope lies in thee. We ask, O oh God, that you will minister to our hearts this morning. We pray that this message will arrest our attention, at least the honest in heart, and create in us a desire to hasten the coming of Jesus. We ask your Holy Spirit's blessing upon this morning's service. This we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Again, a happy Sabbath to everyone. And we do want to thank you for coming out to worshiping with us. We are continuing our series on the seven seals of the apocalypse. And this morning we'll take a look at a wonderful seal, the sixth seal. Now there are only seven seals. And we believe that we are currently under the sixth seal. But don't take my word for it. You will seek to get a gleam from history. Amen. Now to get a context, I want us just to do a quick review. Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, there we see a very doleful situation. Revelation chapter 5, and we are, the texts are on the screen to help us expedite time. And as of always, we use the authorized version, the King James Version. Amen? Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, the Bible says this, And I saw in his what? Right hand. right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written, and on the back side sealed with how many seals? Seven. Seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaim with a loud voice, saying, Who is worthy to, to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Verse number 3, John says, And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither look therein. And verse 4 says, And I, John, wept what? He wept much. I would weep too. <laughs> because no man was found worthy to open the book and read the book, neither look therein. Verse number five, now the Bible says now, and one of the elders, these are the 24 elders that Jesus, that helps to help Christ in the sanctuary, uh, saith, weep not, John. Behold, means look, the who? The tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and loose the seven seals thereof. Verse number six of this same chapter says, And I beheld lo, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, to the lamb, has it been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. Verse seven says in that same chapter, And he came and took the book out of his what? right hand of him that sat on the throne what a scene in heaven now Ellen White now magnifies this she says this there is there in his hand lay a book testing the role of the history of God's providence the prophetic history of all nations and the church herein was contained the divine utterance his authority his commandments his laws, the whole symbolic council of the eternal and the history of all ruling powers of nations were contained in that book. Are you with me? She says, in symbolic languages, were contained in that role the influence of every nation, tongue, people, from the beginning of earth, history to its close. Manuscript release, volume 5, page 9. Now the first four seals we've learned deals with horses uh, there was a white horse then there was a red horse a black horse and a pale horse and these four horses we established they depict the history of Christianity it goes through four phases at first it was pure then it was slaughtered by pagan Rome then the devil joined the church the black horse and he brought in all his isms and his schisms are you with me and then the church became sick and pale horse and then truth would rise again are you with me that's the first four seasons. now this whole series is on dvd hd 
if you want it, with a nice little HD price behind the back. Amen. Right? Now he comes to the fifth seal. And we learned that there were some souls under the altar. They were crying out. These were the people who were slaughtered. The fifth seal, they were slaughtered under the, the, the horses. Are you with me? Now we come to the sixth seal. And in Revelation chapter 6, I'm going to read verses 13 and 14. The Bible says this. And I beheld, when he had opened the what? Sixth seal. Lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. And the moon became as blood. Verse 13 says, And the stars of heaven fell on the earth, even as a what? Fig tree. Cast her untimely figs when she is shaken by a mighty wind. In the book Great Converse, we are admonished to study prophecy. Now she says this, and if you haven't read this book, I, especially in Adventist, I really pity you. She says this, One saint of the Savior must not be made to destroy another. Listen to me now. Amen. Though no man knoweth the day or the hour of his coming, we are what? Instructed. And we are required to know when it is near. Amen. We are further taught that to disregard his warnings and refuse or neglect to know when his advent is near will be as fatal for us. Well, let us, some of them, because we're going to know, right? <laughs> As it was for those who lived in the days of Noah not to know when the flood was coming. Did you know that God gave a sign that let Noah knew the exact time of the flood? Yes. His uh, grandfather was named Methuselah. Amen. And his name really means when it die, when he die, it shall come. Amen. Meth, two words. Methuselah means to launch a missile. And the very year Methuselah died, the flood came. And I believe as Noah saw Methuselah staggering to his grave, he knew we got to hurry up and finish the ark. Because when he die, it shall come. And the flood did come on time. Now as Seventh-day Adventists, we have been blessed by God Amen. to be able to understand mysteries. And you know, there are those who are out there who affirm this. His name is Dr. Fred Price, and you see him on Daystar and TBN and all these networks. And he is the minister and his son and his wife of uh, Ever Increasing Faith Ministries, a congregation of ministries, right? And he said this, quote him. He says, nobody knows Bible prophecies like those Seventh-day Adventists. Thank you for saying that. But they won't leave that old Jewish Sabbath alone. Now, the first part he's right, but the second part he's wrong because the Sabbath was not Jewish. Amen. You know, Adam and Eve weren't Jew, you know that? Yeah. They were people. And there were no Jews for thousands of thousands and thousands and thousands of years. The Sabbath was made for man. Yes. Amen. So we need to get it right. Amen. Now, the sixth seal, Stephen Haskell is one of our, our tremendous pioneers. And, you know, there is a hall in AUC named after him. It's called Haskell Hall. And he wrote three wonderful books, and I hope you have them. If not, you need to get them. Three books. One is called The, 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 uh, the Cross and the Shadow. Yes. Wonderful book on the sanctuary. And then he wrote The Story of the Seer. S-E-E-R. You read 1 Samuel 9, 9, you get that word seer. Seer was called a prophet. So there's of Potmos on Revelation, and he wrote one called the story of Daniel the prophet. Three good books you want to have in your library. Now he says this about the sixth seal. He says this. The sixth seal covers the history until the end of what? Therefore the generation now living will witness as at witness as least some events shown to the prophet when this seal is open it differs from the first four seals he says by showing the events which mark prophetic time rather than the condition of the what so the first four seals red white black pale shows the condition of Christianity but the six seals now deal with prophetic time then he says now those who recognize the signs therein given as omens of the what? Second coming. 
will be, will be, man will welcome him under the seventh seal. You know, I was talking to a, a man the other day, and he was trying to persuade me that we are currently under the sixth seal, seventh seal. Now I try to be hospitable to people, and I do not want to sound dogmatic. And I always try to see if I can make some sense in what people are saying, but that was totally nonsense. You know, I could, we are not under the seventh seal. Now I'm going to show you. And if you hold that philosophy, I, and it's a philosophy, it's not doctrine, I really pity, pity you. Now when it comes on to the sixth seal, there are only three approach one can take. Now here it is now, either you are a futurist, which you put these things way, way in the future. Don't worry about them. We'll be raptured up before these events take place. So don't even, don't even, let's just talk about love and, and grace and hope and sow your seed and you'll get a harvest. So don't worry about them. That's the futures. Then we have the metaphor. Which is, it's only symbolic. Don't worry about it. Just, just grace. And then we have the historists which believes that prophecies will continue to fulfill until Jesus comes. Are you with me? Now, beloved, there are so much confusion out there on the sixth seal. It's just amazing. Now, one who is a proponent of falsehood, and I'm not doubting his sincerity or his Christianity, and I'm not here judging a man. I am judging an idea. We must understand that we can condemn an idea without condemning a man. Amen. And God hasn't given me the right to judge people. But I can judge your concepts. I can judge your theories. I can judge your doctrines. So let's get things in perspective. Now this man here, and I'm not doubting his Christianity. I believe he's a Christian. His name is John Hagee. And he ministers out there in Texas Cornerstone. Now he's a futurist. And he has done an expose on the four blood moons. And he applies the sixth seal to these events. Now you say, not your whistling Dixie. Well, I'm going to show you. Because some of you won't believe the preacher unless you see it on TV. Now I'm going to show it to you. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hello and welcome to another segment of A Spirited Debate. I'm Lauren Green, Chief Religion Correspondent for Fox News Channel. Does God use the motion of the planets to communicate with us, to announce things to come? Well, many people believe that an astronomical occurrence called four blood moons is a message from God. A blood moon is a full lunar eclipse, and four of them in a row is called a tetrad. When they've occurred on the Jewish High Holy Days, it's coincided with major historical events, like the Six-Day War in 1967. Four blood moons on the Jewish High Holy Days has happened only three times in the last 500 years. The next time it occurs is starting next spring on the Jewish Passover. Pastor Hagee has written a book called Four Blood Moons, Something is About to Change, and he joins me now. This is fascinating because I get a lot of books about end times prophecies and what's the Bible trying to say, and this one really fat is, uh, um, fascinated me because it charts history. Of right astronomical occurrences, the Jewish High Holy Days of Passover and the Feast of the Tabernacles, and these occurrences. And I want to go over just a couple of the things that have happened, because it's only happened in three times. Three times in over 500 years. In 500 years. And this is confirmed by NASA. This is not something that a religious think tank put together. This is something that you can check on the internet. This is what NASA says has happened. 
and this is what they say is going to happen. This is, um, and we have a, a full screen up, and, th and I, it's exactly what I did when I saw your book, because I wanted to verify that these things had happened, and sure enough, it was. That's why I wanted to have you on. Four blood moons um, have occurred in 19, uh, 1493 94, fall of Spain, the Jews expelled um, from them, and Columbus discovers America, what the Bible calls it the infant nation. Right. 1949 to 1950 follows Israel being declared a nation state. and then a, a nation state and then 1967 68 the six day war that's those are the last three times yes that a four blood moons have occurred right and so the next time it occurs actually is starting next spring starts April the 15th 2014 next spring and it happens on Passover the second blood moon next year will be October the 8th on the Feast of Tabernacles. And then in 2015, it will happen again on Passover. And then it will happen the last time, September the 15th, and that will be on the Feast of Tabernacles. The, the irony of what it takes to get the sun, the earth, and the moon in a perfect alignment to have a blood moon and then for those blood moons to be on this exact date is something that just is uh, beyond coincidental. Uh, the Bible very clearly says, Joel the second chapter says the day of the Lord will be as when the sun refuses to shine. And the significant thing is that between these four blood moons will be a total solar eclipse and the moon will be turned to blood. That is exactly repeated in Acts, the second chapter. It is repeated by Jesus Christ in the book of Luke, the 21st chapter, when he said, you will see the sun, signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. And when you see these signs, lift up your head, your redemption draweth nigh. So you're saying that this next four blood moons that's starting next spring, is this the end times, what we're looking for, or do, do you not know what is being communicated with this. Technically, prophetically, the end times began with the feast of, with the uh, outpouring of Pentecost 2,000 years ago. Uh, so we have been in the end times when you believe the dispensation, dispensational seven day period of time that equate, equates to the seven days of generation. There are seven ages and dispensations. We have been in the end times a long time. But when we are reaching that point in time when world history is about to change we are entering that zone and it's going to change forever it's going to change dramatically and it's going to involve israel because it has involved israel in 1492 1948 1967 and each time it has gone from tragedy to triumph 1492 as you said the jewish people were kicked out of spain with the Edict of Expulsion by King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. America was discovered and the Jewish people had a home until Israel became the state. In 1948-49, Israel was a state. The thing that preceded that was the Holocaust, a, a, a time of yeah. tears and tragedy. 1967 was the Six-Day War and then Jerusalem became a part of the state. But what do we know what it's going to happen? I mean, uh, uh, we get a lot of prophecy, a lot of end time prophecies. Um, I get the books a lot. And, but there's no telling what is actually going to happen. I mean, you could not have a pre uh, predicted a six day war. You could not have predicted a lot of the things that happened after the Second World War with the, you know, w with the uh, partition of, for Israel. Is there any. Is there any way to predict actually what's going to happen? And it will happen after the last four blood moons, which would be in 2015. There is a sequence of prophetic events that the Bible says will happen, but it does not give a when. It just says when you see these signs, like this, mm -hmm. re, you, re, lift up your heads and rejoice, your redemption draweth nigh, meaning that the end of this age is coming and the messianic age is going to appear. How long is that? No one knows. Well, it's a fascinating topic, and I urge people to not only you know check out your book, but also check out uh, what's on the internet because there's a lot of stuff about four blood moons that people can check out for themselves and see what they think. I mean, there are a lot of people who just poo-poo any kind of end time prophecy. There are a lot of theologians that say that you can't predict what's going to happen. But the the fact is, is that this is an astronomical occurrence that did occur, that happened at this time and that the next one is going to start happening next spring. So it's fascinating. 
And you know, one last thing, though, for the first time in history, I believe Hanukkah is on Thanksgiving. For the first time in thousands of years, and it will not happen ever again. Is that part of what's changing in this world, too? God's trying to communicate with us something, or is this not even related? Well, I, I can't address that because that's not something I've researched. But I have researched this backwards and forwards. And the concept that these four blood moons happen on a high holiday four times in a row with a solar eclipse in the middle is beyond the null hypothesis of probability. This is something that the Bible using the sun, the moon, and the stars as a communication system to humanity says something is about to change and world history is going to change forever. Well, uh, the book is called Four Blood Moons and Something is About to Change. Pastor John Hagee, thank you very much for being on the Spirit of Debate. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. All right, and thank you very much for joining me. All right, that's enough. But you can turn it down, please. I want you to notice the text that he quoted, right? He quoted Joel, he quoted Jesus, and he quoted Acts, right? to support his ideology of the blood moon. Beloved, this is not even prophecy. I don't know what this is. First of all, he is a Zionist. And we have a whole lecture on that. He still believes that the Jews are God's chosen people. No sirree, Bob. He's not. They are not, rather, right? But the text, so from his perspective, he is taking a futurist view of the sun, moon, and the stars, and not just only him. Majority of the people out there who are Christians, they have taken a futurist view of the signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. They have not happened yet, according to them. But let us see what the Bible has to say. You know what? There are eight Bible prophets who talked about the signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. Please write these texts down. They're on the screen. Amos chapter 8 verse 9. Amos says this. And it shall come to pass. In that day saith the Lord God. I will cause the what? The sun to go down when? At noon underscore noon. Not midnight or 1 o'clock or 3 o'clock. Noon. So if this prophecy. Be fulfilled. It must be fulfilled at what? Noon. And I will darken the, the, the earth in a clear day. Isaiah says the same thing. Isaiah chapter 13, verses 9 through 10 says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall what? Destroy sinners. And they're telling me that God doesn't destroy. I don't know where they get these conundrums from. There it is. He shall destroy the sinners out of it. Then he says now in verse, verse For the stars of heaven shall what? And, shall, and the constellation thereof shall not give her light. And the sun shall be what? In its what? In its going forth. Not its setting. In its going forth. That has a connotation to in the morning. Then we have Ezekiel. So we have three prophets in the Old Testament. Four. Ezekiel said this. And, and when I shall put thee out, I will cover the heavens. And make the stars dark thereof. I will cover the sun with a cloud and the moon shall I give her light and all the bright lights of heaven will, will I make dark over thee and set darkness upon the land saith the Lord God so there are four in the Old Testament and we also have four in the New Testament here it is Matthew 24 29 Matthew says this immediately now after what that tribulation in those days shall the what sun be darkened the moon shall I give her light and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers of heaven shall be what? Shaken. So Matthew uh, chronicled it. Then we have Mark. Mark chapter 13, 25. Mark says this. And you know Mark is the first book to be written in the New Testament. 50 years, 40 to 50 years after Christ went to heaven. The first book to be written. Mark says this. But in those days, after that tribulation, a specific tribulation, he says the sun shall be what? And the moon shall give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers of heaven shall be what? Shaken. So Matthew says it, Mark says it, then we've got Luke, the physician. Luke chapter 13, Luke 21, 25. Luke says this, and there shall be signs, plural, in the what? 
sun and in the what? And in the what? Stars. And upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity and the seas and the waves roaring. Matthew says it. Mark says it. Luke says it. Then we've got John on the Isle of Patmos. John says now, now John adds something that um, Matthew, Mark, Luke doesn't add, neither Amos or Joel or Ezekiel. He adds, there shall be a great earthquake. Right? Then he says, the sun shall be darkened, moon uh, as, as blood, and the stars of heaven fall. Now this is the million dollar question now. When or what is the time frame? When should we look for these things? Now here it is now. In Matthew 24, Matthew gives us a starting point. Listen to what Matthew says now. Matthew says immediately what? After the tribulation. So after a specific tribulation, look for the signs. Now, we just read Mark, and Mark gives us something that is uh, a little bit more um, germane. Mark says this now, but in those days after that, a specific tribulation. Now, in the Bible, there are only three major tribulations that have been recorded, captured. Here it is now. The first one we have now, beloved, you're going to have to love history. Now, we are told that there is a history that should not be condemned. We are to, you cannot understand prophecy without history. And, you know, just for not being biased, I am not even going to quote but history this morning. So you can't say, oh, that's your opinion. You're going to have to argue with history. And you have to be an historian to really argue with history anyway, you know what I'm saying? So we're going to just use history to prove this. Now, the first tribulation that was mentioned is, is mentioned in Matthew 24, 9. This was under the church of Smyrna. Now, when you go back and study history, for 10 years, uh, the day for a year principle, the, the Christians were martyred. They were thrown in the amphitheater, burned alive, uh, you know, and covered with wild skin. <laughs> Give the signal, divinity. Peace to the martyrs! Peter. Peace, peace to them. Take thy children, Lord. Numb their wounds, soften their pains. Give them strength, O Savior. Seize that man! Blessed are you, my children, who die in the name of Jesus. Here where Nero rules today, Christ shall rule forever! <laughs> Who is that man? I think he is their leader, a man called Peter. He escaped us before. But he said Christ would replace me. What sort of... They're singing. even in death. The lions will sing louder, I think.
but history says nothing major happened in the sun, in the moon, and the stars after that tribulation. So we can, uh, we can rule out the first one, the early church on the continent. Are you with me? Now, I'm going to take you now in the future to the third tribulation. This is mentioned in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 15. It has two phases, little time of trouble and Jacob's time of trouble. That will take place under Laodicea, the last church, and we are in Laodicea. Are you with me? Now, when this happens, the Bible says that no man can buy or sell. And that is going to be a serious tribulation. So some say maybe we should look for the signs after that tribulation, which is in the future, because currently we can buy and sell. Are you with me? So after we can't buy and sell, some say look for the signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. So they've put these signs in the where? In the future. They haven't happened yet. These are what we call futurists. But then there's one more tribulation mentioned in the Bible. In the book of Matthew 24, 21, it is, the time frame was from 538 to 1798. For 1260 years, Christians were slaughtered under the fourth church, I believe, Tyatara. Now somebody said not, this wasn't really a tribulation, really? Let me show you something. It is said conservatively that between 150 to 200 million Christians lost their lives. If that is a tribulation, then something's wrong with you. That was a serious tribulation. At times, they were caught and thrown in dismal prisons where they suffered great agony for the word of God and for the testimony they bore. Many were tortured and placed on the horrible rack. It was during this time that the Waldenses claimed the promises of God. They kept a pure faith in spite of torture, cold, destitution, and loss of life in the Alpine mountains. They refused to give up the Bible, to confess to priests, to bow down to the wafer and believe it to be the body of Christ, or to acknowledge the Roman pontiff as the vicar of Christ. Now I'm going to suggest, I believe it was after this tribulation that we should look for the signs in the sun, the moon, and the what? Let me open it up now. Now, this is known as the Dark Ages, and the time frame for the Dark Age was 538 to the year 1798. It gives us 1260 years, but I'm going to insert a date. It was 1750. Now, the thing that made this a tribulation was the persecution of the Christians. Are you with me? Now, I'm going to read to you a statement. Now, remember Jesus says, except those days be what? Shortened. Now, what was shortened? Not the 1260 prophecy. It was the persecution that would be what? Shortened. Now, he says, no flesh would be saved. Now, I'm reading great controversy now. Listen to me now. 266. She says, the persecution of the church did not continue through the what? Entire period. The, only the persecution now. <laughs> of the 1260 years. God and his what? Mercy. To his people cut short the time of their what? Fire. Fiery trial. In foretelling the great tribulation. Here it is now. To befall the church. She's quoting Jesus now. Except those days be what? Sure. There shall be no flesh be what? But for the elect's sake, those days shall be what? Here it is now. How are they short now? Through the influence of the Reformation in the 1750s, the persecution was brought to an end prior to 1798. In other words, beloved, you see, it was Satan's plan to carry the persecution all the way through 1260. But God says, no, my people can't endure it. So I'm going to cut the persecution short, but the time frame for the Catholic Church will still continue for 1260 years. 
I believe it was after this tribulation. Now watch it now. That is, that is within the period of the 1260. Are you following me? Or before 1798 and after 17 what? Look for the signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. So we have our time frame now. We are between 538 and 1798 or after 1750. It can't come before 1750. Because the, the tribulation it must end. Then look for the signs. But it is still within the 1260. Are you with me? Hope oh, that wasn't a brain freeze. You got it. Now, if you didn't get it, get a DVD. Now, let's get back to the sixth seal now. Question now. What was the first event that happened when Jesus opened the sixth seal? The Bible says there was a great what? Now, beloved, there have been several earthquakes that happened in, 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 in history. But this history says there was a specific one known as the Lisbon earthquake of the year 17. 55. There it is now, right after 1750. Now, the reason why this was so uh, uh, unique, for several reasons. One, it happened on an All Saints Day, on a Saturday, uh, 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 when churches were full, between 9.30, right? This earthquake happened. Now, here it is, it's Lisbon. Now, Lisbon is right here. So we're in Europe, right? And it, Lisbon is the capital of what? Portugal. Portugal. Now, this is what history said now. This is so prophetic and so profound, this earthquake. Lisbon is the capital of Portugal. Was a commercial port on the Tigris River. Rich and religious in what? It boasted wealthy merchants and more than 40 large churches. The Inqui who? Whoa, oh, the Inquisition had its what? headquarters there now what is the inquisition here it is now the inquisition or, or, or the holy office that ought to ring a bell is the name of the spiritual what of the roman catholic church for the detection and punishment of those opinions who differs from the church you see it was the inquisition that brought on the persecution do you know it was the Inquisition that burned Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer to the stake? It was the Inquisition that burned John Huss to the stake. It was the Inquisition that strangled and burned uh, 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 William Tyndale who gave us the Bible in English. It was the Inquisition that burned the first martyr of the Scottish Reformation. His name was Patrick Hamilton. And it was said by Darwin, yeah, when they burned him, everybody his smoke blew upon became a Christian. And left the harlot, scarlet church of Rome. Now, lest you think the Inquisition is some figment of my imagination or some relic of the past, did you know that the previous Pope, Pope Benedict, whose name was Ratzinger, before he became Pope, the office that he oversees was the Inquisition. Position. So it's still around today. It's still, and let me tell you something. If the laws of this land were removed, the constitution, they would have their way. The only thing that stands between us and the Inquisition is the constitution. The Bill of Rights. But you remove the Bill of Rights. And if your views don't coincide with the Catholic Church views you're a heretic and did you know if you were called a heretic there was no hope for you you couldn't get the last rites what are the last rites a man is dying in bed father bless me I have sinned there was more hope for a murderer and a rapist than for a heretic now history the British geologist named sir and he's sir that mean he was a man of authority he said this, in the year 1755, the most terrible earthquake that ever recorded, though commonly known as the Lisbon earthquake, extended to a greater part of Europe, Africa, and America. 
It was felt in Greenland, the West Indies, in the islands of Moravia, the Norway, Sweden, Great Britain and Ireland. It pervaded an extent of no less than 4 million square miles. In Africa, the shock was almost as severe as in Europe. He said a greater part of the algaes were destroyed. He says 80,000, a village containing 8 or 10,000 people were swallowed up. A vast wave swept over the coast of Spain and Africa, engulfing cities and causing destruction. And if you, were go to, if you go to Lisbon today, there is a monument set up in remembrance of those who lost their lives under that earthquake. He says it in Spain and Portugal, the shock manifested its extreme violence. And I, I can't pronounce that word. Cadiz. What is it? Cadiz. Cadiz. It said that the waves were 60 feet high. That is a tsunami. Thank you very much. I have a witness there, right? Then he says about 60,000 persons perish. He said that the shock of the earthquake was, was instantly followed by the fall of every what? And what? Now, have you ever been in a convent? I've been in one of them. That place is dark. I had Thanksgiving one year with some nuns. They ate mashed potatoes because money had no teeth. But I'm telling you, it was a dark place. To, I said, how do people live in, this, live in this place, man? Dark! One year I couldn't buy a ticket home from school, you know? But listen now. It says now, in about two hours after the shock, fire broke out. Different quarters. Rage was completely destroyed. The earthquake happened, it says, on a holiday when the churches and convents were full. Very few people escape. Here's one, the encyclopedia. This, you can get this. Uh, Americana, get it. They said this, the terror of the people was beyond description. Nobody wept. They cried, the world was coming to an end. They said mothers forgot their children. It was every man for themselves that day. And ran about loaded with cru crucifix images. Unfortunately, many ran to churches for protection. I got a clip on the video. I can show you. I put it in the, in, 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 the, in the DVD, you can see it, right? Look what happened now. But in vain was the sacraments exposed. They, 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 they ran embracing the altars, images, priests, people buried in one common ruin. It was estimated 90,000 persons lost their lives that day. Reverend Charles Davy, he was around, he said this, he says, uh, uh, he was writing between 9 and 10 o'clock in the morning on that day. He says when, when the paper began to to tremble. This surprised him since the day was calm and beautiful. He had heard a rumble which he thought came from a cart in the streets. Then his room shuddered. An earthquake. Look what he says. He heard screams, wails in every direction, churches and stone buildings toppled in ruin, priests led prayers, frightened people, street saints, everybody was slain <coughs> beloved this happened then he said this now he says uh, felt throughout Europe and North America the quake inspired hundreds of sermons ministers held it up as warning some saw it as signs of the what one of the great earthquakes of the apocalypse thousands of people realized they were unprepared for eternity and one he list was Rachel Lowe and she said this she says uh, uh, who afterward became an ardent Christian I would too <laughs> tremble she said the earthquake made me tremble in my soul she says I, I was never under much conviction till Friday after the earthquake 55 I went to church and after that I uh, was over. I went to see Mr. Brown, that who was drawing nice and seeing him, my mind was affected with the consideration that I might be in eternity before him. And I was not prepared in my prepared, prepared state. I was going home and I heard the screams that every step took me drawing nearer to eternity. And the thought I was unprepared to lay heavy upon me. When I got home, Mr. Caleb Burnham came in, was speaking of the Lisbon being, be, being shocked down, shot down by the earthquake. This struck me in distress. I saw my sins to be very numerous. And you read on, she gave her life to Jesus. Now, if this earthquake 
matched up to the Bible. It tells me, and I'm going to show you, that since 1755, we have been living under the sixth seal. Now hold on. It's going to be clearer before you leave. So, if this is so now, the, the earthquake, it opened the sixth seal. It also now assisted in bringing to an end the persecution of the dark ages because the Inquisition had their headquarters in Lisbon. So when that was destroyed, guess what? No more persecution. So it's a proverb in Jamaica, one stone usually can kill two birds. Now let's look at the second event now. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood. Let's go back to Amos now. Amos said this now, that the sun will be darkened at what? Noon. noon underscore noon. So we're going to have to go in history and see, did this, this event occur and it must happen at noon? Isaiah said now, uh, 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 uh. he said that the sun will be darkened in its what? Going forth, not setting. And it's rising for lack of word. Right? Now. Let me open these three prophets up now. Amos declared that the darkening of the sun and the moon turned into blood, which the sixth seal has reference to, would be within the same 24-hour period. One day will be dark, and the night following the moon will be turned to blood. Isaiah says it will be dark and it's going forth. Amos says at noon. Now, beloved, history backs us up. This is how God is good. God gave the people 25 years interval before the second sign happened. History says this happened on May 19, 1780, 25 years later. See, God could have had it happen one, two, three. God's trying to save us. Are you with me? Now, I'm quoting our R.M. Devens of our first century, and this is a very good book. I have it. Right? Page 89 says this. Almost, if not altogether alone, as the most mysterious and yet unexplained phenomena, phenomena of its kind, stands the what? Dark day of what? Now, he's just a historian. Right? A most unaccountable darkening of the whole visible heavens and the atmosphere we are. New England. Now, the Continental Congress was in session that day. And these, it was recorded. This is history, beloved. This is what happened now. Quoting. Twas on May Day after the fair old year, 1780, that, that there fell over the bloom of the sweet life of spring, over the fresh earth and the heaven at, at of noon, a horror of what? Great darkness. Great darkness. He, they said, man prayed, woman wept. All ears grew sharp to hear the doom blast of the trumpet of the shutter of the black sky that the dreadful face of Christ might look from the rent clouds, not as he looked as a loving guest at Bethany, but a stern justice and in inexorable law. Meanwhile, in the old state house, dim as ghosts, sat the lawgiver of the connected trembling beneath the legislative robes. <laughs> it is the Lord's great day. Let us adjourn, brethren. Some said then, as if it were one accord, all eyes were turned to Abraham Davenport. He rose, slow, cleaving with a steady voice, the in what terrible hush, this well, this well may be the day of judgment which the world awaits. Be it so or not, I only know my present duty and my Lord commands me to occupy till he come. So at my post where he hath set me in his providence, I choose for one to meet him face to face. Not no faintless servant frightened from my, from my task, 
but ready when the Lord of the harvest calls. Let God do his work. We shall see to ours bringing the candles. It was said, it was so dark, a white piece of paper could not be seen. The darkness was so thick, candles could not be used. God cares, Mervyn Maxwell says, they adjourned and they could not see the face of one another. An eyewitness who lived in, at that time frame said this, in the morning, the sun, arose, the sun rose clearly. Remember, I knew now, but was soon overcast. The clouds became lowery uh, uh, from them, black and ominous, as they soon appeared, lightning flashed, thunder rolled, a little rain fell. Towards what? In its going forth, there it is now. The clouds became thinner and assumed a, a, a brassy or coppery appearance. And the earth, rocks, trees, building, waters, and persons were changed by this strange unearthly light. A few minutes later, a heavy black cloud appeared over the entire sky except a narrow rim at the horizon. It was as dark as usually is at 9 o'clock on a summer sunny evening. Fear and anxiety all oh, gradually filled the minds of the people. Men returned from the labor in their fields. Carpenters left their tools, blacksmith their forges, tradesmen their counter, schools were dismissed, Ch children hurried home, travelers were put up, what is coming? It may be a hurricane or the consummation of all things. It was said candles were used, even the roosters begin to crow. Went back to sleep, cattle gathered in their pastures, Bars and lowered, frogs peeped at nine o'clock in the morning. Birds sang their evening songs, the bats flew about, but the human knew that night had not come. The darkness was most dense shortly after what? And that is secular history. You're going to tell me that you can't trust the Bible, and you're going to believe some Quran over the Word of God, Amen. or some catechism over the Word of God. Shame on us! History. Why don't we hear these things in our churches? I'm going to tell you why. Because the devil has pulled a number on some of us. When was the last time you heard this? Even in our church. You hear more about praise and praise and praise and praise. A whole bunch of sinners praising God. High lives must be holy for hands to be holy. Then the Bible says, and the moon became as blood. And history says, beloved. In that night, the Essex Antiquarium, April 8th and 9th, volume 3, this is history, it says, after midnight, the darkness appears, and the moon, when first visible, had an appearance of blood. Look what he quoted now. The description of the event as given by the eyewitness is but an echo of the word of the Lord recorded by the prophet Joel. So history was quoted in the Bible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're going to tell me that Bible and history don't collaborate. Did you know that, 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 that all, all, most of history was once Bible prophecy? And it is said that prophecy is history in advance. Mm -hmm. History is Bible prophecy fulfilled. Here it is now. The moon, Samuel Tinney, in the collection of Massachusetts Historical Society for the year 1792, volume 1, page 97, it says, the moon, which was at full, had an appearance of blood, a lawn that, that it caused, and the frequent talk about it impressed it deeply on my mind. But there's more. The Bible says this now. The third event. And the stars of heaven fell on the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she's shaken by a mighty wind. Now look how God is good. This event, based on history, was fulfilled November 13, 1833. So what God did now, God put a 53-year span between the second event trying to give people time 
And the devil wants you to believe you got plenty of time. He has all folks believing they got plenty of time and they are staggering to their grave. The stars fell. I'm going to quote history. History backs it up. November 13th, 1833, 53 years later, the last event that Jesus said would happen under the sixth seal happened. Now I'm quoting now, the New York Journal of Commerce, November 14, 1833, quoting, at the cry, look out of the window. I sprang from a deep sleep and with wonder saw the east lighted up with the dawn of meteors. I called to my wife to be held while rubbing. She explained, see how the stars fall. I replied that this wonder and we felt in our hearts that it was a sign of the last days. For truly, then they're quoting the Bible now, for truly the stars of heaven fell on the earth even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she's shaken by a mighty wind. Revelation 6.13. Then the article says, this language of the prophet has always been received as what? Metaphorical. It was what? Literally fulfilled of yesterday. So as no man before yesterday had conceived to possible. Skip on down. St. John used this prophecy quoted. That's secular history quoting the Bible. The, uh, Peter Macmillan who invented a telescope he said it was between 100 to 200,000 stars fell per hour you thought 4th of July was something these were signs and people who understood the word knew this to be the sign of the son of man even the American Indians saw this and on their calendar it is said this here it is uh, 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 the great plains recorded plenty stars even the American Indians who lived here chronicled this even the old Negroes by this time people were still in chains and out of this they wrote a song my lord what a morning when the stars begin to fall you type it on YouTube you'll see it Affirmed by people. Now, beloved, if this does not affirm you, then something's wrong with you. Abraham Lincoln was a very good president. And he wasn't president the year the stars fell. Right? And in this book, see, I, I, like, I like Abe. You know what I'm saying? Abe goes to Washington. So he wasn't president then. The record said he was asleep. And a servant said, Master Abe, Master Abe, the stars are falling, the stars are falling. Abe got up out of his bed, looked out the window, saw the stars fell, went back to sleep and covered himself. The servant said, Master Abe, Master Abe, why are you going back to sleep? And it was recorded this, quoting, he said, surely I saw it, but when I looked up into the heavens, I saw what the prophet John said would take place. Then I looked even beyond that and saw the great consolation still in place. I knew that God was still on the throne and all was right with the world. Abe knew that this was a sign of the coming of the Son of Man, but the world had not ended yet. And in his state of mind, he felt comfortable. And he went back to sleep. Then, just in case you don't believe Abe, you ought to believe Frederick Douglass. Now I, in high school, I had to write a research paper on this man. And I probably did a lot more reading than most of y'all. But in his book, The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass, you ought to get it. It's a good book. He was around when the stars fell and Frederick Douglass said this about the stars quoting I witnessed this gorgeous spectacle gorgeous spectacle and was awestruck he said 
the air seemed filled with bright descending messengers from the sky. It was about daybreak when I saw the sublime scene. I was not without the suggestion at the moment that it might be what? Of the come of the Son of Man. And in my in and, and in my then state of mind, I was prepared to hail him as a friend and as a deliverer. He goes on to say, and this is so touching now, he says, I had read that the stars fall from heaven and they were now falling. I was suffering very much in my mind. I was looking away to heaven for the rest denied me here on earth. And in those days, slavery was in full swing. And those in the north were free, but the south wasn't free. And they could go to the north and take you to slavery in the south. So he said, I had no rest. But I was looking for the rest denied me. Your Frederick Douglass affirmed. He wasn't no Adventist. It's not Adventist. This is history theology. And you're going to sit there and listen to John Hagee. He's going to lead you to hell with his theology. And only those who realize these signs will prepare themselves for when the seventh seal opens. So what then, beloved? Here it is. Do you know that since 1833 and now it has been 170 years Israel only wanted 40 years in the wilderness, man. Peter says, you say, well, why hasn't Jesus come yet? Peter says, God is not willing that any should perish. Amen. He says he's not slack, as some men count slackness. But he's long suffering. How long? He has given humanity 170 years. Noah only preached for 120 years. And only eight got on board the ark. So we have gone over, we have on borrowed time. He has given us 50 years, and some of us, if God give us 100 more years, you know what we do? We will get caught up in buying and selling. And put Christ's coming afar off. I'm going to show you something now. Revelation chapter 6 now, the Bible says this now, as we wind down. And the stars of heaven fell on the earth, even as a fig tree what? So right after this, the next major event, and the heavens what? So beloved, it tells me, for 170 years, we have been living between two verses of scriptures. And you think you have a, a, a whole lot of time to get it right. The devil has pulled a number on you. Because the next event that happened is the coming of Jesus. Now you say, hold on, not you're exaggerating. Let me tell you something. Satan knows that we're under the sixth seal. You think he doesn't know? And that is why he has caused these preachers on TBN. You will never hear this on TBN or Daystar. T.D. Jakes will never preach this. Because if he does, then people will wake up. They will realize the jig is almost up. And the devil now, he has his demons. He's like a quarterback. And he's calling the play. He has his multifaceted program going. He has some, they just work all day and party all night. Just keep them busy. He got some just lying around doing nothing. And we seem to think that we got to go out and commit some big thing to be lost. You can be lost by coming to church and just sit and say that was a good sermon and be unresponsive and you'll end up in hell. The devil knows we're under the sixth seal. He knows it. That is why society has gone haywire. And if you're not careful, there is something to grab your attention. And you got Adventists, you know, they're, the thing on their mind now is whether or not Miami Heat is going to win the, the NBA. Do you think heaven is concerned about some stupid basketball? Let me tell you something. LeBron James and, and what's, that, what's his name? 
Dwayne Wade, what's that tall fella? Those guys are in trouble. If they don't wake up and smell the coffee under the six seal. And let me tell you something. Hey, there'll be no buying and selling in hell. Now I'm going to show you something. Between verse 13 and 14, there are several events that must transpire. Because we must have an intelligent concept of prophecy. So, this is Revelation 13, um, 6 verse 13 and 14. The stars fell. The next event is the coming of Jesus. But in here, there are some events. One, the mark of the beast must be passed. No man can buy and sell. When that happens now, it is the final shaking in God's church. Let me tell you something. Sheep and goat will always grow together in the church. Wheat and tear will always stand and praise in the church. When this happens now, there's a final shaking. Shake out the hypocrites. Why are you with me? The compromisers. Then now, it is the final sealing. Listen, one guy was trying to tell me that the sealing began in 9-11. I'm going to tell you when the sealing began. You want to find out? You come week after next. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to preach on it. I'm going to show you when the sealing began. And it wasn't no 9-11. Far from it. The final ceiling. Then comes the what? Let it rain. Let me ask you a question. If you're out doing your garden, do you water the garden before or after you pick up the weeds? Logically. You don't want the weeds to grow. So God cannot water the church with let it rain until the shaking. Because the shaking shakes out the tears and only the wheat remain. The wheat receives the latter rain. They go out now and they give the loud cry. What is the loud cry? It is a message for this time. It is now publicized. People who are in those churches who have never heard about this. They will now have an opportunity to hear the warning. Because if Jesus would close probation before a person hearing, then Jesus would be unfair and he would have to pardon that person. So every man must have an opportunity to hear or then reject or accept. So once the, 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 the loud cry, a lot of martyrs now. Remember the fifth seal, until their fellow servants shall be slain, rest a little season. That are those people now who are keeping God's commandment. Then after the, the, the loud cry is given now and the final saint come out of Babylon, then Jesus will now say, he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. This is the seventh seal. We're going to talk about it. We're not under the seventh seal. If we were under the seventh seal, probation would have been closed. So when Jesus says it is finished, then probation closed. He now tossed down the censor. He steps out from the sanctuary. Are you with me? Then the seven last plagues fall upon those who did not respond to the message. And then the second coming of Jesus. And we are here. Unless you think I'm making it up. Let's go back to Matthew as I close. Jesus says immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened. And the moon I give her light, and the stars shall form her heaven, and the powers of what? And here it is now. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. And all the tribes of the earth shall what? Why are they mourning? They should be rejoicing. These are people who were not ready under the sixth seal. Verse Revelation 16 says, And the kings of the earth. And the great men, and the rich men, and the chief men, and the mighty men, every bondman, every free man, hid themselves. And why are they hiding? They ought to be saying, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. He will come and save us. But they're running. Why are they running? Because they're not ready. To the rocks and to the mountains. Why are they saying, Fall on us and hide us? From the face 
of him that sit on the throne and from the wrath of the what? Running from a lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. And know what John does now. He asks, when John, he says, Lord have mercy. If these things are so, who shall be able to stand? Now when you read the, the sixth seal, logically, the seven seals should open up. You find the, the, the seals in Revelation 5 and 6. But the last seal comes in Revelation 8. What John does, when he asks the question, who shall stand? Revelation 7 now, who's going to stand? Those people who are sealed. And we're going to talk about the sealing. It didn't begin on 9-11. And there is a sealing, and then there is a seal. Oh, let me tell you something. Not everybody who has the seal will receive the sealing. But everybody who receives the sealing will the seal. You see, the seal is a part of the sealing. You can have the seal and not receive the sealing. So who shall be able to stand? Oh, those who are sealed in their foreheads. Beloved, if these things are so, and I believe that since 1755, we have been living under the sixth seal. Only one more seal at the open. And when it opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven. Not for an hour, or two hours, or three hours, half an hour. I wonder what John meant by that. You come out, and you will see what that half an hour means and what it entails. Beloved, the Bible says that God is coming back for a church without spot and wrinkle or any such thing. Now for those who do their laundry, you know that when your, when your work clothes has a spot on it, you've got to wash it. Am I talking truth now? So you put it in the, in the washer and you get that stain out. And you put it in the dryer, it dries it. But is it ready to be worn? You've got to iron it. And you know what Mrs. White says? She says as I close, this is our washing. And ironing time, beloved. It is time now for Jesus to wash us of impurity and wickedness and laziness. And we want him to iron us out. She says we are now in the washing and ironing time. The time when we are to be cleansed, to cleanse our robes of character in the blood of the Lamb. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world, shall we not let our sins go who shall be able to stand now beloved let me tell you something you must understand that the majority will never be lost will never be saved in the days of Noah the majority drowned in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah the majority burned do you know that in the days of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the majority bowed down, only three stood. And when Jesus left earth, he ministered for three and a half years. He had opened many blind eyes, and he had healed many lame, and unstopped the ears of many deaf. And when he left, he only had 120 followers. It tells me that in the last days, uh, the majority will never be saved and you have to determine in your spirit Lord if there is only one person who recognizes the signs under the sixth seal and get ready I want that person to be me I want that person to be me who shall be able to stand did John see you did John see me and perchance you want to be in that number beloved that stands when the seventh seal is open i want you to stand to your feet this morning don't just stand because you are ready to go now stand because what you have seen on the screen is true we want to be ready if these things are so beloved then now is the time to prepare 
Now is our salvation even nearer than when we first believe. Hello, this is Evangelist Carlton Knott with the final Movements Ministries. I do hope and pray that this ministry has proved to be a tremendous blessing to your soul. And I want to personally thank you for your support, prayers, and otherwise. Beloved, Jesus bids us to work while it is day, for the night cometh when no man can work. May God help us to take up the task that lies close at hand in giving to the world the message of a dying, risen, and soon coming Savior. Continue to pray for us as we pray for you in the finishing of the work. And remember that great changes are soon to take place in our world and the final movements will be rapid ones, Maranatha.